Today is the fifth Sunday of Easter. Welcome to worship. And of course, it's also Mother's Day. Mothers have strengths that amaze men. They carry children, they carry hardships, they carry burdens, but they hold happiness, love, joy. They smile when they want to scream. They sing when they want to cry. They cry when they are happy and laugh when they are nervous. They fight for what they believe in. They stand up for injustice. They don't take no for an answer when they believe there is a better solution. They go without new shoes so that their children may have them. They go to the doctor with a frightened friend they love unconditionally. They cry when their children excel and cheer when their loved ones get rewards. They're happy when they hear about a birth or a new marriage. They are strong when they think there is no strength left. They know that a hug and a kiss can heal a broken heart. Mothers come in all sizes in all colors, all shapes. They'll drive, fly, walk, run, email, or text just to show you they care. The heart of a mother is what makes the world spin. Mothers do more than just give birth. They bring joy and hope. They give compassion and ideals. They give moral support to their family and their friends. Mothers have a great capacity for giving and an even greater capacity for loving. Thank God for mothers. I also want in these early moments of our worship to say a word of congratulations to Reverend Katie Faison she graduated from McAfee School of Theology yesterday. We we're very happy for that. And she also wanted me to note that next Monday, not tomorrow, but a week from tomorrow, uh, the purses in the pew will be meeting in the Heritage Room. And uh, reservations need to be made this week uh, for lunch and for name tag preparation. So hopefully you'll call ladies who are available to be a part of that event a week from tomorrow. On Wednesday of this week at 2 o'clock, we'll be dedicating the Central Baptist Church Columbarium at Forest Lawn Memorial Park. Uh, special thanks to Scott Wilson and his family for their generosity and making the Columbarium possible. Wednesday at 5.30, we have our weekly dinner together followed by activities for youth and children. And at 6.15, a special women's Bible study in the Heritage Room. And at 6.30, midweek worship and Bible study in the chapel. We sing and pray and share fellowship with each other. This week we'll be studying 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 25, under the title, The Shepherd's Example. We encourage you to be present for that as well. Now Taylor Drake is coming to share with us a feature regarding the Georgia Baptist Children's Home and Family Ministries. Thank you, Drake. Thank you, Winford. I was asked to speak to you today briefly about the Children's Home, as today is the day of our annual offering, an offering this church has collected for over 80 years. It began in Atlanta in 1872 as a home for destitute and helpless children orphaned by the Civil War. This ministry expanded significantly over the next 145 years. Today, the Children's Home has three main campuses located in Palmetto, Meansville, and Baxley. It has two service centers, Good Shepherd, 
located in Warm Springs, and Camp Hawkins, located in Mount Airy. It also has two group homes, Alice's House, located in Carrollton, and Angel's House, located here in Newnan, which our church and many of you directly support. The Children's Home has many services and ministries it provides to children and to families. For example, the maternity program is a residential program that provides medical care, spiritual counseling, parenting classes, and postpartum care to teen mothers. The Victory Program is a residential program for girls ages 17, sorry, 12 to 17 years old who have been victims of child trafficking. This program uses innovative counseling and education techniques to offer hope, healing, and restore dignity to these young women. The Family Care Program assists families who have experienced homelessness and or domestic violence. The goal of this program is to minister to these women and children to help them find a safe place to begin a new life. The Ascend program provides residential care to children and youth with developmental disabilities. This program assists these children in learning independent living skills and individual care skills. The Good Shepherd program provides residential care to troubled adolescent boys through a unique farm-based treatment program. These boys are given a chance to start a new life built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. And there are many other programs and services. In 2016, the Children's Home served 1,068 clients. 699 of these were residential clients. The Children's Home receives approximately 18% of its total financial support each year from churches. Currently, its operating budget is approximately $14 million. So it expects to receive approximately $2.5 million from churches. In 2016, approximately 1,750 churches contributed to the children's home. Of these churches, Central Baptist Church was 17th in amount given. Historically, however, over the past 80 plus years, Central Baptist has usually been in the top 10 of an, an amount given to the children's home. It is my expectation, but also my prayer, that this church will continue to be motivated to contribute money to the children's home. So it's Christian ministry of providing hope to children and to families who come from hopeless situations will continue to flourish. Thank you.
please join me in the call to worship. <clears throat> King of all the earth, creator of the universe, holy triune God, from everlasting to everlasting, you are Lord. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Find strength in the Lord this day. We come into your presence, O God. We proclaim your praises to all the earth. Let us pray. Creator God, you are the creator of the sunrise and sunset, the creator of the highest mountain and the deepest valley. Lord, we praise you this day as we celebrate one of your most precious creations, our mothers. Hear our prayers, Lord, as we come before you this morning. Declare your message to us and grant us the courage to listen. May our listening turn to action and may our actions touch the hearts of those who need to hear your voice. We put our trust in you, Lord, knowing that it is well placed in your hands. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself. 
where she may have her young, a place near your altar, Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk is blameless. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. May I have the boys and girls join me in the front? Good morning. How is everyone this morning? Good? Have you hugged your mama yet? Uh... Why would you want to hug her extra special this morning? Because it's Mother's Day. Because it's Mother's Day. Y'all already know that, don't you? Oh, thank you for my hug. Thank you. It says in the Bible that mothers are very, very special. Do you guys believe that? I know y'all already know that mothers are very, very special. Um, Your mother is very special because, well, she's your mom, but she also brought you, or she or your grandmother or somebody, but probably your mom is here, brought you to church this morning, right? Why did she bring you to church this morning? Or your grandma? (laughs) My own child is telling y'all that I did not bring her to church this morning. Her dad did. (laughs) That is very true. Well, somebody brought you here, but we're just going to say it was your mom. Brought you to church this morning so that you could learn about who? Jesus, Jesus, God. And it's such an important thing, and mothers are really good at making sure you do that. Does your mom carry a purse like this one? Um, Mm, Lots of times moms have really big purses with lots of things inside. We're going to go through here. Maybe your mom has, let's see what's in here. You might be surprised. I guess your phone is in there. Maybe a coin purse or a wallet that has money in it. Moms are really good at paying for things, right? Yeah. You never know when you might have to buy something. What else? Tissues? Does mom always have a tissue when you need it? You need tissue to wipe your nose or, or maybe wipe tears if something happens. You need it? Okay, you can have that. What about, oh, this is one, bubble gum? Moms always have good treats in their purse to make a sad person happy, right? Bubble gum. Is that mine or Emma's? That's Emma's. <laughs> what about brush to make you look good? All right, this next one, I don't know that your mom carries one. I know I don't, except for on my phone, because there's an app for it. But what about a Bible? No. <laughs> okay, well, maybe, maybe, your, maybe your mom has the app, too. But a Bible is super good at remembering that we should follow Jesus. And so maybe mom doesn't carry it in her purse, but I bet mom has a Bible and helps you remember the right path to take. And it's a good reminder for us, right? So let's praise God this morning for creating your mothers and making you their children, because it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Let's pray. Dear Lord, 
We thank you for our mothers. We are thankful that they are always prepared to help their children and lead them in the right path. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I don't know about you, but I get nervous when Katie asks children those questions. <laughs> Let us now join together and uh, pray for those in our community who need our prayers. Let us pray. Giver of life, we are thankful for the opportunity we have to be community to each other. Not only do we have the privilege of helping and doing for those who need us, but we also share in moments of prayer for these concerns. So in this moment, we pray for those who are facing or recovering from surgery and for others who are facing serious health concerns. We especially remember Dr. Jimmy Thomason Cindy Adams, Dana Phillips, Zoe Beavers, Ralph Koontz, LaRoyce Wright, and Christy Lucky. We also continue to pray for Dr. Bo and Linda Mann and their entire family as they grieve the sudden loss of their daughter, Stacy Morrison. May your spirit of comfort continue to surround them in these hours and days ahead of them. On this day where we give you thanks for the mothers and mother figures in our lives, we also want to pray for those around us who are without their mothers or any parental love at all. May we, your church, do what we are able to assist in the care for these. Christ not only came here to show us how to reach out and care for the needs of others, but he also taught us how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Let us pray. Lord, let our congregation be a witness to you, immersed in scripture, constant in prayer, joyful in worship, generous in giving, a loving, supportive community reaching out to those in need. Accept these gifts we offer in Jesus' name. Amen.
take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin then sings my song Thank you, Ann and Kathleen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Esther, chapter 4, verses 10 through 17. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces Know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But thirty days have passed since I was called to go to the king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today's sermon is the second in a series of sermons titled, Ordinary People, Extraordinary Stories. 
Everyone loves the transformation story, rags to riches, plain to beautiful, weak to strong. And Esther's story is that and even more. It is an account of God's working mightily in one life and how godly attributes like courage and dignity and wisdom and strength can thwart evil and replace terror with joy. The name Esther comes from Astor, name of a goddess in Persia. Esther was a Persian Jew who was orphaned at a very young age. The Israelites had been ex exiled in Babylon in 586 B.C., and many still remained there a hundred years later. The date for the setting, the story of Esther. When Esther's parents died, her cousin, who was considerably older than she, took responsibility for rearing her. And Mordecai developed a deep affection for Esther and reared her as though she were his own daughter. And as the years unfolded, there was a tremendous mutual loyalty between the two. Even when Esther became queen, she continued to look to her cousin for advice and for guidance. She trusted this gentle Jew as though he were her father. As Alexander Wyatt once expressed it, Mordecai brought Esther up and loved her as though he loved his own life. And after his love for Israel and after his love for the God of Israel was his love for his little adopted daughter. And after a life of encouraging and shaping and praying and conversation and sharing life with her, he stood by as he watched this young woman lifted up from exile and from poverty and actually made the, king, the queen of the greatest empire then standing on the face of the earth. Indeed, Esther is a classic example of an ordinary person with an extraordinary story. Esther was the Persian name of this descendant of Benjamin and is from Aster, meaning a star, and implies, like Venus, that of good fortune. We refer to the star of hope, the star of joy, and Esther were these things, and of course, even more. To her people in the splendid galaxy of Hebrew women of ancient times, no name stands more prominent or shines more brightly or with richer luster than the name Esther. Hadassah, signifying myrtle, as in the beautiful myrtle tree, was Esther's original name. The change of name from Hadassah to Esther may indicate the kind of developing beauty for which this once captive orphan, now a Persian queen, was famous for. Esther is revealed, you see, in Scripture consistently as a woman of clear judgment, of magnificent self-control, and capable of the noblest sacrifices. The lines of Lord Byron can be fittingly applied to Esther. She walks in beauty like the night of cloudless climes and starry skies, and all that's best of dark and bright meets in her aspect and her eyes. Esther was a beautiful woman. And while still a young woman, when her presence was requested at the palace of King Ahasuerus, it was a wonderful opportunity 
for this former orphan to become the queen of the land. You see, the story goes like this. Ahasuerus, king, had recently disposed of his wife, Queen Vashta. He had held a 180-day feast. Mind you, that's a six-month feast. That's a lot of food and a lot of wine and a lot of fun, you might say. And indeed it was. And it was held in Susa, the capital of Persia, for all his officials. And after that, he then gave a seven-day banquet for all the people. And on the seventh day, as Scripture says, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he ordered his queen Vesta to appear before him and his guests wearing no veil, which within itself was dishonorable. And then to make things even worse, he ordered her to appear before himself and all who were present wearing only her crown to show off her beauty. To her credit, Queen Vesta greatly displeased the king by refusing his request. So that precipitated her being fired as the queen. She no longer held that place of honor. So he needed a new wife, a new king, and so he ordered all the virgins in Persia to present themselves in the palace for him to choose a new queen. Again, I say Esther's personal beauty can hardly be overstated. Her dark, exotic features marked her out, and she was therefore chosen as a leading candidate for the king's favor, who, when he saw her for the very first time, was captivated by her physical beauty and charms. But it was beyond her beauty that also shone a radiance of personality and of character, which enhanced her beauty and gave it distinction in the eyes of Ahasuerus. So he chose her as his queen. Esther then moved away from her small Jewish community into the palace. And Mordecai advised her not to talk about her heritage, not to admit her Jewish heritage because he was not sure how the king would respond or what sentiments he truly had toward the Jews. Meanwhile, Haman, a hater of Jews, but an advisor to the king, proposed a day of execution for all Jews in Persia. And he brought his proposal to King Ahasuerus that on the 14th day of the month of Adar that all the Jews be exterminated and the king signed the order not realizing that his own bride would be affected by this mass slaughter. Esther did not know about the agreement between Ahasuerus and Haman, but Mordecai, her cousin, knew all about it and met with Esther to inform her of what was going on. And then he demanded of Esther that she speak to the king and beg him to revoke the decree. But Esther knew what we read in Scripture a few moments ago, that no one, not even the queen, could come into the king's presence unless that person had been invited or had been summoned. For if one were to go in uninvited, that person would be killed automatically. Therefore, fearing for her own life, she told Mordecai that she would just simply stay out of all this. As most of us humans, we would prefer not to get involved in something as dangerous or as controversy as this. But Mordecai explained to his young cousin that when the 14th day of the month of Adar came upon them, even she, the queen, would not be spared. In order 
to prevent the execution of all the Jews. Mordecai calls on Esther to intercede with the king. In his mind, Esther was the only one who had the favor of the king who could prevent such disaster. But as I've already suggested, the problem is that the king does not know that Esther is a Jew. And Esther ha has no idea how the king will respond to this news. Now I remind you that even though the word God does not exist or appear in the book of Esther, the only book in all of scripture that the word God does not appear, we can see God's action woven in and out of all the writings in this short book. And one of the things that stands out is nothing takes God by surprise. Esther's reluctance to approach the king is met by the stern words from Mordecai in Esther chapter 4, verse 14. Now famous, well-recognized words. Mordecai says, Esther, if you keep silence at such a time as this, Relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another quarter. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, Esther, perhaps you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. To her credit, perhaps sensing the nudge of God's spirit, perhaps not only sensing that nudge, but also having the love for her kinspeople spurred by her cousin, Esther eventually agrees to appeal to the king. But she says, before I do that, Mordecai, I want you to organize a time of national fasting. She is well aware of the fact that she needs God's favor if she is to succeed. And perhaps most, if not all of us, know that fasting is a godly exercise which has the potential, doesn't happen automatically, but has the potential for bringing us closer to God and making us bolder in our witness. So in chapter 5 of Esther, she approaches the king and invites, and invites him and Haman to a banquet. This is an attempt to get the timing right before she informs the king about Haman's plot to kill the Jews, of which she is one. As I've already said, Esther had hidden the fact that she was a Jew from the king on Mordecai's advice. God's timing is always best. Earlier in my life, and I still have the tendency, I've wanted to get ahead of God. I've wanted to crash the doors down. I wanted to move on with things. Many times I've thought God was just a little too slow in acting. But I have found over the years that God's timing is always best. The right thing done in the wrong time is the wrong thing. And it's very dangerous to get ahead of the timing that God has in mind for us. So the time came for Esther. And she sensed that it was the proper time. And she called upon the king to come to a dinner with herself and Haman. Fortunately... Ahasuerus cared very much for his new queen and was receptive of Esther's invitation. And when she and Haman and Ahasuerus sat down for their meal, Esther began to plead with the king to not kill his wife, his own queen. Ahasuerus, of course, was stunned totally surprised by Esther's outburst. 
And Esther then revealed Haman's plan in its entirety and then admitted to her own past, her own heritage as a Jew from Susa, the king's home city. Well, Ahasuerus, a proud and rather hot-tempered king, decided on the spot that Haman and his ten sons would be eliminated. And he charged them with treason and for threatening the life of his queen. So Haman and his ten sons were hanged on the 14th day of the month of Adar, the very day that Haman had set aside for the execution of the Jews. So Esther, even though she needed a little convincing and a little encouraging, was able to save the Jewish population in Persia. She is considered, to none of our surprise, one of the most heroic women in all of Jewish history. Indeed, her story is read every year at the Feast of Purim. Esther has so much to teach us, but let me quickly list just a very few as we close our worship time. For example, she teaches us that there is always a preparation time for doing God's work. Esther allowed herself to be prepared for the task God gave her. God's preparation time can sometimes be long and uneventful. Remember last week we studied Moses and we were reminded it took 40 years for God to prepare him on the backside of a desert to deliver God's people from bondage. The refining of our character is very essential to God's plan for our lives. God cannot use an ill-prepared, or proud, or egotistical woman, our man, our son, our daughter, our child. Secondly, we need the favor of God, Esther teaches us. And she found the favor of the king, and so did Mordecai. Scripture tells us that even Jesus grew in favor with God and people. When you live a life pleasing to God by obeying God's ways and God's will, you will find favor with God. And God will also give you favor with people. God rarely, rarely, if ever, uses angry, cantankerous, difficult people who do not find favor with God or with other people. Third, God works in his own time and season. Esther understood that and got her timing right. Maybe God has put into your heart or into your mind to do something for him. I want to encourage you, don't just jump into it, but wait for God's timing. Joseph was in jail until it was God's timing for him to be released. God will move in his time when we remain faithful and alert to his leading. And the fourth thing that I would quickly remind you of your background does not hinder you from your future for God's work. Esther was an orphan. God still exalted her and used her. Some of Jesus' disciples were common fishermen, tax collectors hated by the population, and one was a doctor. Your background does not determine what God can do for you. Your faith is what matters. And finally, gender does not matter. Your gender does not matter as to how God may use you. All of my adult life and all of my ministry, I have been struck by the fact that from the beginning of time, God has used women 
to be a blessing to other people, indeed to bless the whole world. It was the women who were the first to come to the tomb to witness the resurrection. God always uses women. What would the church be without women? It wouldn't be, period. There's so much for us to learn from Esther, not the least of which is our learning to listen to the still, small voice of God whispering to you through the Mordecai of your life. Who knows? Who knows but what you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Who knows? In a moment, we'll be led in our departing hymn And if you're prompted to come forward to become a member of this church, we would welcome you. The requirement for membership here is your belief in Jesus Christ as the Son of God and your personal Savior. Or there may be other decisions you'd like to share publicly, and I'd invite you to come and do that. Or you may also make quiet, personal decisions where you stand or where you sit. Just don't overlook the fact that you may have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. I saw you guys back there, and I was hoping this might be the day. So glad that you're, you're coming to be members. That's great. Well, that's wonderful. We'll have our hands full of them. <laughs> Who knows but what you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. It's a wonderful time for this church, and you're going to add immeasurably. I'll introduce you in a few minutes. If you'll let people speak to you at the close of the service, I'd appreciate that. You can just step right over here if you like. Thank you. Would you be seated, please? It is a wonderful day to to worship the Lord. It is Mother's Day, but it's also a beautiful day, and every day is an opportunity to serve each other and serve the Lord. I'm very happy today to introduce to you friends of ours who've become involved in our fellowship in recent days, and perhaps you have had the opportunity to, to meet them. Adrian and Debbie Neely. Would you come and stand here for just a minute? Adrian is the executive director for the Interfaith Airport Chapel at the Atlanta International Airport. And Debbie is also one who's preparing herself for special Christian ministry. I know that you rejoice with me in welcoming these, Adrian and Debbie, to the fellowship and to the membership of Central Baptist Church. If you'd like to give expression to that, why don't you just say amen if you're happy about this decision? Amen. Okay, I think they mean it. <laughs> I'm going to invite you to stay here for just a moment at the close of the service so that uh, people can come and speak. It's been good to see you seated with family and friends today, and uh, we're glad that you all are here. Excuse me for just a second here. I'm going to ask you to stand now for our benediction.
and hope you will come and speak to Adrian and Debbie. Now, as you go from this place of worship, go with the presence of the resurrected Christ. Go with the power of the Holy Spirit. Go with the word of God dwelling in you richly. Go with the love for one another which Christ commands. And the love of God, the joy of the Holy Spirit, the peace of Christ will be yours today and always. Now I want to encourage you to savor this moment of silence before returning to a world that is filled with the noise of living. <laughs> 